Hey everybody, welcome back to Coach Hall Rights. Today's video is all about how to teach argument. So I'm really excited to introduce Amanda. I actually met Amanda at the AP reading very briefly and then over the summer at an AP Lang consultant meeting. And I was really excited to hear her ideas about teaching question three, because I'll be honest, that's my least favorite of the three FRQs. And so I think we're going to have some great tips today, just kind of talking about how to make this more approachable for our students. So welcome, Amanda. Hey, Beth, thank you for having me. Um, I love to talk about argument and it's actually, it is my favorite and I don't think it's very many people's favorite. And, and that's kind of a change. Um, there definitely, I think has been a feeling in the community for the last couple of years, maybe the last five or six years that the students struggle more and more with argument. And um, I don't know if that's because of the redesign of some of the history courses has kind of changed what they know. I don't know if it's just that there's, there's this sentiment that they just don't know as much as they used to know. And so when they go in to write those argument essays, they don't have as much to say. And um, and that can be very frustrating because I think for a long time, um, I felt like that was the sort of thing that I couldn't move the needle on that very much. So it's like, as a teacher, I felt sort of helpless. Um, but I shifted some things in my practice over the last four or five years that have made a big difference and have made it so I really enjoy argument and my students really enjoy argument. And that's always the thing that they want to talk about. And I have to like, no, 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 no. When they come out of the exam is what they did on their argument essay, which that's, that's a big change. So that's been really exciting. And it's had some knockdown effects on synthesis, obviously, because I think it helps argument certainly helps synthesis. And so the biggest thing is I really started to rethink how we approached this idea of coming up with examples, because that's always like the, the hard wall. You know, you teach all this, you talk about thesis statements and claims and all this. And then the kids are like, yes, but what if I can't think of anything? And the go to seems to be um, like acronyms and charts and all kinds. There's a, a gazillion of them, many of which are very clever. And I've used a lot of them to kind of help kids access, you know, current events or literature or all of these things. But for a lot of kids that does, doesn't seem to translate into the kind of rich explanations that we would like. And and I the more I kind of I thought about it, the more I took a lot of inspiration from the AP Lit exam. Because in the AP Lit exam, they also have a Q3 that is open-ended. But if, and I don't know how much crossover there is in your audience, but on the Lit exam, the students are supposed to write about a novel. And it said, the question will be something like, um, I think it was like a character who has forged a new identity. So select a novel in which a character has forged a new identity and talk about how um, this contributes to a, an interpretation of the work as a whole. And lit teachers spend all year prepping kids for that Q3. Like it's the main focus of their course, way more so than the first two questions. And what they do is they prepare them with an example. Like they read novels very much with the, and when you write about this novel, these are the kinds of things you'll want to talk about, or these are the kinds of things you'd want to say. And, and we don't really do that. Like we don't we don't really do that. And so and if you went to a lit teacher and you said, well, hey, should they use novels that they like have read on their own? Most lit teachers would prefer they didn't. I mean, not because they would necessarily be bad novels, but because reading a novel and studying a novel are different things. And like I read Jane Eyre at high school on my own, but I should would not have done a good job writing about Jane Eyre because I didn't study it at that stage of my life. And um so in the same way, it was like, why do we expect a kid to go in and like write about something from their own experience that they've never discussed analytically or maybe even never reflected on? I think this is why we um, I think this is why Disney movies get so controversial, because all of us can look at like Encanto and we can see how if we sat down at the table and somebody wrote about multi-generational trauma can can destroy even families where people genuinely love each other, we would be delighted. But that's not when kids see Disney movies, they see them as children. And so they write about them as a child understands them. And that's not going to be multi-generational trauma. It's going to be like Simba ate bugs. And so um, or personal experience, it's the same way. Even if a kid has like an absolute bang on perfect personal experience, 
if they've never reflected on that experience and they've never written about that experience and they've maybe never even told anybody about that experience, like they've never put it in story narrative form, they're not going to do a good job writing about it. And it's and once I realized that, I felt kind of dumb that I'd been expecting them to. And um, so I came up with this idea that we should have a curriculum that's a lot more idea centered, that's a lot more um, focused on, you know, I always selected works and I think most of us selected works um, as primarily because of the exemplars of either just really strong writing or of modes of writing that we wanted to illustrate for our students. And even if the content was interesting or even if it was thematic content, I wasn't often focusing on the content nearly as much as I was focusing on like the structure or the choices or the approach. Um, and I think a lot of the times I assumed they got the content more than they did, like the actual ideas. And so I kind of shifted and I sort of started thinking in those terms. So for example, I'm gonna share my screen here and show you some things. Okay, so if we look here, what this is, is um, this is my education unit that I just finished. And you'll notice that down here in the corner, I have your anecdote. And that's because one of the things I'm starting this year is to actually have them kind of workshop anecdotes a little bit. Like if you have a story that you like, can we can we work with it a little bit and practice writing about it a little bit and tell you know you could use that as sort of a flexible story and i'm not going to go through all these i will point out that i'm not abandoning well written things i'm not saying you know get rid of the stuff that we read that's good um all of these have a place in a traditional you know ap lang um curriculum but when we talked about them, we spent a lot of time talking about the underlying ideas and the arguments. The only thing that probably should not be included would be um, the cognitive science. Like that's kind of new that I did a unit or within my unit, we took a couple of days to talk about learning and cognitive science because that gave some connection to these other education sources and what makes education effective. So as we worked our way through the unit, we did what everybody did and we talked about connections and things like that. And in fact, we really doubled down on the connections. If we look at this next slide, this would be an example of the kind of thing that I do towards the ends of the unit where, um, and I know you can't read the writing, but it, it's not really that important. The blue squares are quotes. And what I gave them like 16 quotes per group and they you know, narrowed it down to three. And then they kind of turned the quotes that they liked into thesis statements, which is what the pink is. So they you like that. And then the yellow is these same, these, these it's actually I cut and pasted off of the, the whiteboard software I was using. So they I took these and they connected them and then they started explaining them. Okay, and they started explaining these connections. And as you can see, some of these sources um, are like, like this student connected his anecdote to all three of the theses. Um, this source right here, Mark Rober, is connected to two of the theses. So they're starting to see how they could use the same source and connect it to a variety of different arguments and kind of explain it. And they really like this. They're starting to get into it. And so they're starting to see what's happening. But the real payoff comes out when we go back to here and it's like the last essay of the unit. And I tell them to look at this and I say, OK, before we look at the prompt, I want you to write down the two things that you really hope you can write about, that you really just think, you know, these are the ones that I like, that I understand, that make sense to me. And they, you know, they sit there and they write all, all over them. And then I show them the prompt and I do the one from the CED that's like, books are the best of things, well used, abused, among the worst. And I say, okay, does your source have anything to do with books? And they say, no. I can't write about these. This isn't going to work because none of those are explicitly about books. But then we come back and we look at it and I was like, well, what would Mark Rober say about books? And if you don't know who Mark Rober is, he's like a YouTube guy who does science stuff and my, my students all love science things. So, um, but he blows things up professionally and he does like, um, but he, he did a TED talk about, about, um, how when there's penalties for errors, even if the penalties don't matter, um, people quit earlier. And that, that was the one we had watched, but they all know Mark Rober. And so they're all like, oh, Mark Rober would say books are terrible, that books are not an effective way to learn, that you should learn by going out there with your hands and figuring it out yourself. Okay, well, what would, what would he have said in the TED talk? Oh, he would have said you have to be able to make mistakes. 
okay, well, you got the starts to a pretty good paragraph there. Like, that's a pretty good one. And then I'd be like, okay, what would Horace Mann say about books? And some kid will say, Horace Mann would like books. You know, Horace Mann said that education is like, you know, we got to get facts in people's heads so they can go get good jobs and, you know, make America strong. So he would he would love books. OK, then I, I think we can talk about one of the things that makes books well used. And then I'll say, OK, what would Plato say about books? And I would have some kids say he'd say they were shadows on the wall. And the other kids would be like, yeah, shadows. And we would, we would talk about why. And and the thing is, is they and I go through all of them and talk about it. And that's when it starts to come together. And the thing is, is that when the connection is not obvious and they have to build it, now they have a thing to write an essay about. Now they have a paragraph because when your example is superficially very apt, you know, your your example of a dangerous book is a book. There's nothing to explain. And that's why we get these row B2s where students are just over and over and over again. They're just kind of repeating um, their evidence over and over, or they're just moving from one piece of evidence to the next to the next with no explanation. And it's because they, they don't, there's nothing that they see needs to be explained. It feels very obvious to them. And sometimes it is very obvious or they don't have enough, enough depth of understanding. So I'll do this all year. And I'll, you know, we, I have right now I'm doing education, identity, adversity, and community are my four units, which are very broad and um, allow them to sort of connect back as they go to all of these sources. And we'll sort of keep all of them in play all year. And the most amazing thing that happened when I did this is that they started pulling rhetorical analysis passages into their argumentation essays. And I had never seen kids do that before. It was it came out of nowhere and it came all at once from a lot of them. So we had read the Scott Russell Sanders about migration, mm -hmm. which is a, a beautiful, beautiful piece. I mean, I read it even though it often they're terrible because I, I love the piece. And so we had talked about it as an idea, not just as a thing. And in the next essay, I was kids were talking about, you know, America's romanticization of travel as like a supporting idea. I don't even remember what the, the argumentation was, but it it kind of worked, um, but that they were they were starting to sort of integrate ideas more into this broader thinking. Or they, they, there was a skill here that had been missing that I had not realized was missing, which is this building a bridge to connect instead of trying to find the perfect example, if that makes sense. And, um, and so we kind of worked on that. And then by the end of the year, um, I have something like this, and this is from last year, and I'm sure it'll be different this year because you know, the readings evolve all the time. But, um, and you know, they have their outside readings, which we do talk about some. And in fact, for their outside reading towards the end of the year, I started having just an ongoing assignment where they would need to connect what they read to something else we had read. So I'd sort of be like, from this chapter, see if you can connect it to something from our identity unit or something from our education unit. And they made amazing connections that I never would have thought about. And, um, and and so we're building that line of reasoning. Um, sometimes they would try to then use these sources in their synthesis essay, and that was usually not that successful because synthesis essays don't really need more. But it certainly helped in their synthesis essay for them to understand what it meant to really write a connection between two ideas that are not already identical to each other. So that would be my, in a nutshell, what I've started to do differently than I've really seen anyone do. And I mean, maybe lots of people are doing this, but I haven't seen it, um, that has really made teaching argument fun for me. And it's fun for the kids. Like they all wanted to tell me what they wrote about on argumentation. Um, you know, they, they all came out, actually, we had the community voices prompt and a lot of them wrote about um, shooting an elephant. And which is kind of a counter example, like not the one that you would have expected, right? And, but that's because they'd gone in prepared to write about shooting an elephant. I told them to pick in advance. And and I and they did very well with that. And I thought that was a very um, it was it was the opposite direction from where you would expect kids to go with the power of community voices. It you know was sort of a negative example, but um, but it's a good example. And I'm sure they had a lot to explain about why community voices can be dangerous. Um, so it's interesting. So yeah, so that would be that would be my secret recipe for argumentation if you're if you're really really bored with acronyms. <laughs> I love this. I am one of those people that like has always kind of used an acronym because that's what I was told when I first started teaching AP Lang. And so I use chores 
which is the one that's like current events, history, outside knowledge, reading, experience, and science, or at least that's how we do it. But reading the R and chores is always one of the weakest ones when kids are brainstorming to the point where they'll usually just kind of skip it if they're doing it on their own. And I realized a couple of years ago that my students aren't retaining the knowledge of what we're reading in class. Like they just, if we read it for rhetorical analysis, let's, let's say, they assume, okay, well, yep, we found the choices. We identified the message, the argument, the purpose. Like we wrote the essay, we're good. And they weren't applying it to future argument prompts. And so I would assign a prompt that in my mind connected and I mm-hmm. read the essay and then I'm like, why is no one writing about, you know, whichever passage it was? And they would tell me, cause I would ask them, they would mm-hmm. say, oh, well, under pressure, we didn't think about that. Like we thought of, you know, maybe a historical example, which my students who take uh, a push AP US history, mm-hmm. they seem to do better because of how our A push teacher runs her class, but not all my students take that class. So some of my students don't have that same historical knowledge as others. Most of my students are not as well versed in current events as we might like as teachers. And then of course, personal experience, like you were talking about before, that's something I'm also working on with my students is like having them write about certain situations that were meaningful to them because we don't want the first time you write about yourself to be on the AP Lang exam. No, we really don't. <laughs> and, and, and you have the same issue with, um, in some ways, like history can be almost dangerous because like I read um, the disobedience prompt a million years ago and um, it had the word revolution in it. And so many kids wrote about the American Revolution and some did it very well. I mean, it, you could write about it, but it wasn't an easy example because revolution isn't exactly disobedience. Mm-hmm. And they didn't really thread that needle at all. And they didn't know, I mean, they, they, it was like, they didn't really know the history. They, they weren't picking the example because they understood it. They were picking the example because they thought picking a good example would carry them through. So mm-hmm. they didn't have anything to say other than, I mean, nobody could say, you know, if, if it had been George Washington's disobedience, um, you know, in the Fort Necessity fiasco is what taught him, you know, like something like that, like that would be great. But instead it was like, they disobeyed King George and threw that tea into the ocean. And after that freedom, I mean, it was like, there was, they didn't know <laughs> exactly what they did how it happened. <laughs> correct. But if that's your understanding of what happened, then you don't have a robust explanation of what it shows about human nature. I mean, again, the, they're, they're not penalized for making a historical mistake. I do want to emphasize that, but they don't, they also don't have much to say because those mistakes are sort of illustrating how little they know. I feel like those essays are the ones where we can just t- kind of tell the line of reasoning is weaker because the examples themselves are not particularly strong. So then there's not much to say about those right. examples. Cause I saw that this year, I was on the persuasive um, mm-hmm. prompt for Q3, the one about yeah. persuasion and yeah. students chose a lot of the same examples and it's like, okay, you know, not that it's wrong to choose something that is common. Are you choosing it because you actually know about it or are you choosing it because it's the first thing that came to mind? And I think that's kind of the issue. And I understand, you know, there's a lot of pressure on exam day, Mm -hmm. but I like your idea here because I think it's going to lead to some more nuanced essays because some of the stuff you've been talking about is stuff that we don't typically see as evidence. But if they've already talked about it in class, they're going to be well familiar with it. And those essays are so much more refreshing to read, not just as an AP reader, but as a teacher, Mm -hmm. they're so refreshing to read. So I love this approach and I love how you're showing it with the, an education unit, because I I have an education unit too. Oh, really? Yeah. We're starting that. So I'm going to steal some of this. First of all, what's your software? Cause I love the, the notes. How did you do Um, that? This is called Mural. And I will say they used to have a free education thing and now they don't. I'm seriously considering seeing if the PTSA will buy it for me because like I love it and the kids love it. Going back to the cognitive science thing, one of the things they talk about in cognitive science is that, you know, it's the act of organizing that builds understanding. And it, that sort of made me realize that we tend to, org- we give kids graphic organizers, which or- do the cognitive work for them like and not just english teachers like history teachers are even worse than us we organize the information and then we have them plug it in Mm -hmm. but it's the organizing the information where you learn Mm -hmm. yeah and 
I think and that's so, why the hexagonal or hexagonal, however you say it, thinking is yeah. becoming really popular is because it's letting kids put those ideas together. I like using a whiteboard software and there's various ones out there because it allows them to, you know, very fluidly for them to decide where the connections are. Yes. Um, yeah. This looks I, awesome. I like If you're going to do an education unit, the one thing you should do is out of everything that's on those sources is if you haven't done Lockhart's Lament, have you ever read that? It's called The Mathematician's Lament. No. It's a it's an allegory where he, he starts out with like a mathematician wakes up one day and like imagines a world in which the way they teach music is that kids have to like, they just learn, they, they only are allowed to write music until they're um, learn to read and write music until they're in high school when they're kind of allowed to listen to it. <laughs> and he's kind of saying that that's how we teach math. Yeah. Or if we taught um, painting as um, as paint by numbers. Oh, wow. Okay. And we never allowed, and we're like, well, you don't paint on a blank canvas until grad school, at least, you know, and, <laughs> and it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful piece. I'll send you, it's actually like a 40 page essay, but that's the opening to it or those two allegories. I'll send it to you. They, they, the kids, if you're, your mathy kids just will really, really like it um, because it's got the, um, and even maybe actually, actually sometimes the non-mathy kids like it because it kind of validates why they never liked math. <laughs> that, that would be, know, this, that would be me. This, as a student. <laughs> this was poorly taught to me, you know? Um, so it's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. So it's, it's, this is just, like I said, they get excited about it. They, when they start to see and make those connections, they, they're proud of themselves. Yes. And, I think that's really awesome. And I like how you've got it arranged. I like the different graphics that you've shown. Cause even the one now with the different post-its, like, mm -hmm. so my, my classroom TV broke, um, at about week two of school. So, um, all the stuff that I spent time digitizing, oh, no. I can't, yeah. I can have my students do it on their Chromebooks, but I can't show it on <laughs> my, my TV. It's supposedly getting replaced soon. We shall see. Yeah. Um, so I would, I love this activity, but in, if I'm going to do this soon before they replace uh -huh. the TV, I'm going to have to get some actual post-it notes on my dry erase board and let the right. kids go, go to town right. with uh, the markers. But I think that would be a really fun, like, um, tactile experience for them too. just kind of, um, like doing this. So did you, um, did you choose the, the different components of this and then they made the connection? I gave them 16 quotes. And they called it down to three. So every group ended up with three different quotes. And and then they extracted. So I gave them the blue and they got rid of most of them. Then they extracted from the blue into the pink, which is like a thesis statement. Okay. Okay. And then the yellow is just what the yellow is this. Like this okay. is literally from the same. Like this was how it was given to them was in a box. And then they grabbed them out and moved them around. Do you see what I mean? And then they copy pasted their anecdotes onto green ones. Oh, so, okay. and then the, and then the way the program works is you can double click on the connectors and type on them. We had a lot of fun with this and we'll have a lot of fun with it. And it's, it's made me enjoy reading my argumentation essays and it's made them enjoy writing them. And that's the biggest thing I think. Awesome. Well, I love this. And I think, you know, not just new AP Lang teachers, but I think veteran AP Lang teachers can benefit from this as well, just because I know there's a common question of like, how do I get my students to choose better evidence? And, and we're not saying like acronyms are bad because I'm still going to no, use chores. No. It still helps my, some of my students, but I, I also think we need to be realistic about test day. You know, we want them to come prepared. Uh, and even with chores, um, I do something that I can link in the description of the video too. And I'll put all of Amanda's stuff there that she's willing to share. Um, I have my students kind of focus on, you know, your top historical figures that you know, and your top historical events, you know, closer to the exam, we really narrow in on like, what can you write about well, because just because you heard about it on TikTok, or just because you spent a day in history class learning about this person does not mean that you know about it well enough to actually write right. about it in your essay. Same with personal experience, just because you won a basketball game when you were in eighth grade does not mean that that is the experience that belongs in your essay. And so I think the benefit to this is just helping students realize that they do actually have a wealth of knowledge to write about. I think this is really empowering, but also from the teacher's perspective, 
I think this is a great way to help us kind of organize our ideas and kind of make those connections between what we're teaching for rhetorical analysis or just other texts that we're using in general Mm -hmm. and the argument essay that we can reuse ideas. Going back to what you were saying about the, they don't pick up on it. You know, if you go across the hall to your lit teacher, they just assign, I mean, they will tell the kids you're writing about the scarlet letter on this Q3 Mm -hmm. because that's their book test. Like they don't like that's that's the end of the unit. Like, we, you know, we were doing a unit on Frankenstein. So now we're going to do it. In fact, they're more likely to give the kids a choice of Q3s to Mm -hmm. put Frankenstein to like than that from the people I've talked to. A lot of the time, the longer an AP lit teacher teaches, the fewer and fewer books they read. Yes, I've noticed that too. Yeah. Brand new AP lit teachers. We're going to read eight books. And, and they also will nag their AP Lang teacher. They'll be like, you've got to read novels. My kids need lots of novels to go in there because they need to have read 11 novels so they can go in there and they will have read something that matches that Q3. But the really experienced lit, lit teachers are like, we do two novels and a play. Mm-hmm. And we talk about them. And there isn't a, a prompt on earth that if they've read two good novels and one good play or maybe like two good novels one good play and one choice book that they did book circles on Mm -hmm. everybody will be able to write about one of those like they will there's nothing that could be on there that that they will not be able to write about and then they they spend more time talking in depth about those books and getting to know those books and talking about different themes and all of these things and and it works fine so i think that that um I think that restricting their choice is actually helps them a lot. So like I even did, like I did the overrated essay. It's the first one I do every year when we were about halfway through this unit. And I told him, I said, you have to pick something in education. Mm -hmm. And we just watched the uh, one video that talks about how grades are ineffective in in education. And I said, and I do grades. I was like, I think grades would work really well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your ideas. I think it's going to be really helpful to new teachers and veteran teachers. And it's something that we don't have to do this right away. Like, it sounds like you're doing it with your units. And so if you're watching this video and you like these ideas, you know, think about an upcoming unit this year where you could just give it a try. And like, I mean, just one source. Yeah. Yeah. Pick one thing that's super flexible that you can be your secret sauce on everything. Yeah, there you go. And like Amanda said earlier, you know, it changes from year to year. So that's just a a tip from those of us who have done it for a few years is like, it doesn't look the same year in and year out. You know, you, you change based on the kids that are in your room or, you know, what you want to teach or just what's going on in the world. But I think this is a really helpful idea. I'll put some links in the description for people as well so that they can kind of get an idea for what this might look like. But thank you so much for taking the time to share this idea and um, best of luck in your school year. Thank you. You too.